Hey, welcome to the 166th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by a patron, Tim Johnson. I'm Matt Unlow. And I'm Oren Kaplan, and today we have Seth Worley on the podcast. He is one of the co-founders of Plot Devices, and also just like a guy I've been following his career and his tutorials, his VFX tutorials, for many, many years. He works for this company called Red Giant, which makes like some of my favorite plugins, Trap Code Particular, which lets you do smoke and fire effects, like everything you need for green screen king or anything and he like made all their tutorials for years and now he has his own company that helps filmmakers construct stories is it accurate to say Oren, that you fanboyed out a little bit i think so but i kind of was excited because it seemed like he was like a fan of ours too he was like quoting episodes of ours well we're patting ourselves on the back Yeah. So um, I'm super excited to talk to him, talk about like balancing being a filmmaker that made like a bunch of like cool artistic like short films that got into film festivals, but also that were marketing tools and how he kind of balances his life, how he moved to LA, why he did it, and then how he started this company to make products for people that are struggling with like story structure and things. And, you know, if you're stuck on your story and you need a way out, check out plotdevices.co. They make all sorts of cool products that help you out with that. And they're the sponsor of this episode. What I love about this conversation is that I think that there's a real entrepreneurial spirit that Seth embodies, but that a lot of our the filmmakers that we've had on have exemplified. And I think this one, we get a little bit more explicit and dig a little bit deeper on what it takes to chase the different creative impulses that a filmmaker has and to like follow those curiosities. Well, cool. Before we get into our interview with Seth Worley, I just wanted to remind people that we have a Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash justshootitpod. And it is a place that you can support the podcast if you'd like. And also, if you give us 10 bucks, we are going to send you a Just Shoot It, the podcast hat, which uh, they've been going like hotcakes. Hotcakes. I also uh, just sent literally every single sticker, everything that we've owed to our patrons, I just sent literally today. So uh, by the time this episode airs, we should be seeing stickers on laptops we should see hats on heads life is good for just shoot it fans yeah uh, let's say you're trying to gain an instagram following post a picture of you wearing a just shoot it hat or sticker and we will retweet it repost it repost like it follow you we'll do all those things all that stuff uh, but genuinely, it is really cool to see those posts, and it makes us feel like we have a better understanding of who our listeners are and what they want. So thanks so much for sharing those posts, everyone. Patreon.com slash just shoot a pod. Okay, now we are going to talk to VFX guru, director extraordinaire, story nerd, Seth Worley. Okay, so Seth Worley, a filmmaker extraordinaire. What do you yes. what do you call yourself when someone you meet someone at a party? That do you really say extraordinary? No, no, because that would be I, a great bit. I bumble over the words filmmaker, director, writer. Still, I mumble them to where people can just interpret what they want because they all sound pretentious. You've been doing it for like ten years at least. Yeah, but I don't want people to ask like, "Oh, have you made anything that I've seen?" Because the answer is usually like, "No." Or you awkwardly list off the things that you've done, and you have to no one's heard of any show. of it. Yeah, writer, director. And uh, a bunch of other things. Producer, do you think you're a guru? I mean, I don't think, do people refer to you as a guru? No, thankfully they don't. So when I started doing like tutorials and such, I made an effort to not waste people's time. This podcast may not prove evidence of that, (laughs) but I'm mortified and, and terrified of wasting people's time with my own voice. And so when I started doing tutorials, I would... Most people would record this screen capture and and then talk over it in real time and then just post it. Like, I recorded it all. I edited it down. I re-recorded the voiceover, made it move like crazy fast, and uh, ended up kind of creating my own style in that way. I forgot that we're already off to a bad start. I've forgotten why I started that story. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, because I asked if if people refer to you as a guru. Yeah, yeah. No, so the point is, like, I've gone so far out of my way to say that I'm not an expert and that no one would dare think of me a guru. Just, just to hold on, just to play devil's advocate, though, it just sounds like you're doing a very good job at your job, which is kind of well, thank you. guru-like in a way, right? Okay, fine. Listen, <laughs> I'm really good. You're like Red Giant's Andrew Kramer, right? Isn't that uh, what people call you? No, Red Giant has plenty of Andrew Kramers. Um, Who else? Uh, Arnold Benowitz, Daniel Hashimoto. Uh, oh, he's movie good. Kid. He, he's fantastic. Uh, Harry Frank, uh, Stu Mashowitz. Yeah, but how many of those people have a brother that makes music and acts in their shorts? Only me. 
Yeah. So I guess I, I guess that makes, I guess that's the definition of guru. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, look, let's take a step back, right? And talk a little bit more broadly. Give us a little bit more context about both yourself as a filmmaker and maybe also like your kind of relationship to Red Giant. Yeah. So I wear lots of hats. Uh, I am at the heart of it like writer director. I direct commercials not as regularly as you guys probably do and other directors, um, partly because I also have the luxury of a full-time job at Red Giant where I make all kinds of marketing content, like short films is what I started out doing for them. And Red Giant is kind of like a, yeah. a software provider. Or yeah, it's a visual probably. effects software company. They make go. plugins for After Effects and Premiere, uh, Magic Bullet Suite, Trap Code Suite, um, stuff for motion graphics, color correction. I got started with them. I did a short film for them back in 2011 called Plot Device. Arn Rabinowitz had found me. So Arn Rabinowitz is the director of marketing at Red Giant. Um, he found me because I did a, uh, there was, uh, ABC did a contest for the last season of Lost uh, where they invited fans to make promo for the finale, the series finale. And the winner got to like go to a party where like one background extra would be <laughs> there and present or something. I don't know. Um, so was it I, in Hawaii? Uh, was uh, I have no the idea. Party? It was going to be in LA. Oh, okay. I did not win. Um, I, in fact, I didn't even enter it correctly. <laughs> but I made one because uh, Trapcode Particular, which is a uh, particle system made by Red Giant, works in After Effects. I had just recently kind of learned my way around it. And one of the presets is this like smoke emitter that looks like eerily familiar to the smoke monster from Lost sure, in a way that sure. makes you wonder if like chicken or egg if it was that was the chosen design because it's so easy to create or not the um so i made a promo uh for that with the smoke monster the idea is that it was after loss is over it's the smoke monster in various suburban environments looking depressed and you know on a treadmill <laughs> and such and because arn rabinowitz has a like google alert for anything red giant related he found this promo that i made and invited me to make a tutorial for it and while I was working on that tutorial. He saw some narrative work that I had, these little mini series I had made at my job at the time, making uh, programming for events and uh, youth summer camps. And there were these dumb little narrative comedy shorts that we made for like, you know, 5,000 a piece. And uh, he was really Im interested in the 5,000 a piece aspect of it and the, uh, and just I think he liked the quality of them and invited me to make a short that would showcase Red Giant software, but be a standalone short on mm -hmm. its own that would have a behind the scenes piece to go with it. And were you, where were you living at that time? Nashville, Tennessee. And that's where you're from? Uh, that's where I'm from. Uh, Red Giant's everywhere. They're based in Portland, but we all work remotely. Um, I did Plot Device mainly just because I wanted free software and because I wanted to be able to have that connection and get free software for sure. a while. And that was your short that you made for Red Giant? Uh-huh. Did they pay you or they were just like, oh, hey. Yeah. Oh, okay. We had a budget of 10000 and I kept maybe like two of it. And mm -hmm. then we paid the crew in free software. A few people did get actually paid, but most people work for the free software. It's like thousands of dollars worth of yeah. software. Yeah, it's like a great, if you care about the software, it's like an awesome deal. It's awesome. Yeah. It only works once because <laughs> no, everyone has the software. Yeah, and yeah you, you, can't you do unlock the door. Yeah. We've never talked about this before on the podcast, but like, it's an in interesting to think if you're writing, producing, and directing something and you're getting paid for it and it's like your thing, like what percentage of the budget you keep. And I think that, that makes sense. You get $10,000, you spend eight, and you keep two. It's been a while since I've had to do that because I'm full time there, but 10% is like a bare minimum. But if you're also like editing, if you're jack of all trades at that point, it's kind of like keep whatever you possibly can, but put as much on screen as you can. For me, it's more like what my wife tells me is the bare minimum <laughs> to keep, to be worth the time. So I did that. That was back in 2011 when you could make a short and it goes viral and you're directing a Thor movie two weeks later. I did not direct a Thor movie, but I did get the Waterball tool, Tour of LA. I had agents. In what year is this? 2011? this 2011? I had people calling me. Because, because they saw your short on YouTube? Yeah, uh, Vimeo. Well, technically Vimeo, but yeah, it went... Um, this is around the time... This is like a month before Dan Trachtenberg's um, mm -hmm. Portal, Portal short. Sure. And so that that season was when a lot of these... You know, Gareth Edwards had just gotten... Mon just, just sold Monsters, and I think it just gotten on Godzilla. 
And so uh, at the, around the same time, Red Giant was very excited by all of this too and said, sure. hey, if you ever want, want to make any more shorts, like let us know. And I saw the opportunity as kind of a, a pinata of sorts of like, like I'm, I'm the boring kid at the birthday party who like when the pinata gets hit, I just stand there and wait for everyone to be done jumping mm-hmm. over each other and I grab whatever candy is left which usually ends up with like two pieces of candy but right. I don't get Smarties hurt usually. in the process yeah, yeah. and I saw kind of like a wave that I knew would crash down at some point and I wanted to land on my feet at the end with as much long term benefits as possible but I wasn't prepared at all to be like in a room suddenly able to like pitch my own material or mm-hmm. pitch on giant projects so when Red Giant offered me a chance to go full time and make you know, tutorials and more short films with them. I jumped at that opportunity and they've been, they're incredibly flexible and give me, um, it's all about the work that I get done and I'm allowed Mm -hmm. to like do side projects and personal projects on the side and direct commercials and pitch things. And that's kind of the world I've been living in since. And so do you, are you repped by any of these Uh, people? Oh, cool. And then for commercials, do you, are you repped by someone else? Uh, no, I've never really got, I uh, never got a commercial rep. I direct a lot of regional commercials out in Nashville. Then when I got out here, mm-hmm. I got connected with Adam Lissagor at Sandwich Video. And he was very kind and generous enough to hire me for uh, several projects right off the uh, commercials right off the bat when I got out here. Which was, it's kind of absurd. Like the few commercials that I have done, aside from the regional ones. Well, the regional ones that I've done have just been fun. I've been fortunate to work with great people for some... Like Nashville regional? Yeah. Uh, there's a, for example, there's a fast food chain east tennessee i believe called pals sudden service Mm -hmm. um and they're if you ever get a chance like their branding is wonderfully kitschy with these Mm -hmm. like cool yeah and and so they're really fun to do ads for um but then when i got out here so i've (laughs) the two people that i've worked for out here uh, in terms of like national commercials are like jj abrams and adam lissagor of sandwich video which is like like two creative fun. heroes. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> kind of two different ends of the spectrum, yes, though, right? Yeah. yeah. And but they're probably fans of yours, too. Adam has been incredibly kind and sweet and was uh, had seen my work prior. J- I can't speak for JJ, only the people that tell me that JJ watched Plot Device. He mentioned Plot Device in, a, in an interview with Playboy magazine, which was one of those where it's like, can I buy this <laughs> and keep it at home? Um, <laughs> yeah, I would say definitely. Yes, if it's for the articles. <laughs> um, I have it in a very special place. Yeah. It's like under your mattress, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah perfect. A pillow. <laughs> cool. It's perfect. easily accessible. <laughs> so you're part of this whole like kind of ecosystem of VFX, like like Andrew Kramer, like even probably Freddie W and like some of these people. You, you, you guys have kind of hold this like special place in the world and when i saw jj abrams like he guest edited a episode like a issue of wired magazine and he said one of his suggestions was like video copilot.net that's how i found out about kramer i was, was like that mind issue. blown that yeah. that jj abrams watches the same vfx tutorials that i watch i did one commercial for jj i it was like uh it was a insurance commercial that was a star trek in a darkness tie-in and it was i don't know somebody talked somebody into hiring me to come in it was the first commercial in-house commercial bad robot ever did and the last cool. one so <laughs> i'm very proud to have ended go. that congratulations shut that down quick yeah i love those sandwich videos you haven't uh, i should have asked you this while we were, weren't recording but you didn't work with kevin rosenquan yeah sound like a deep old buddy of mine yeah. i adore him and kevin is kevin is for for the view for the listeners at home kevin is uh my immediate I immediately loved Kevin because he wears these like patented <laughs> t-shirts with his first name on them in this wonderfully radical 80s font. I tell this story all mm-hmm. the time. I suspect that Jay cuts it out because I tell oh, it really? all. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, but we're going to keep it because basically everyone's always like, oh, yeah, I love to do name tags. Like that's a very trendy thing for directors to do. And I'm like, <laughs> Kevin's got you beat. <laughs> and Kevin, only that you probably talk about, but he sells the shirts. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, which... Uh, I am kind of sad. Oh, what if I had just ripped open? I was wearing oh my, my God. Kevin shirt. We would be best friends forever. Yeah. yeah. No, I love him. Yeah, sandwich is awesome too. Well, they're the best at what they do uh, in terms of like explainer videos. Like, it's just a very uniquely Adam's voice that kind of stretches across all the videos. It's yeah. just like kind of dry, um, approachable. Yeah, it's like a little wry, right? Yeah. What's interesting to me about kind of what we're we're talking about here is there's this unique e- ecosystem and i think sandwich is kind of actually part of it right but you know your andrew kramers your freddie w's you guys of the world of like 
making technology and tutorials, basically explainer videos, uh, more accessible, more human, right? And it's a fascinating thing um, because, you know, every time you're like, I need to figure out how to like use this tool or whatever, there's always a, a ton of videos out there of like, you know, some teenager teaching you how to do awesome VFX. Yeah. Um, makes me feel so old. But what makes these videos stand out so much more is the personality behind them. And it's interesting to me that like, we're just kind of all talking about people who've really kind of made a, a career out of it in a really exciting way. Yeah. And it's interesting that you said you try to originally you would try to cut yourself out of your like tutorial videos as much as possible or but, cut it down as fast as possible and make tons of jokes like a person, you know, like any socially awkward, insecure person who leans on comedy as like a defense mechanism. That's how my tutorials are structured. Sure. But but most VFX videos are not funny, is what I'm getting at. Really. Well, all the best ones though, like <laughs> yeah. Andrews, and then um, Hashi's Daniel Hashimoto's his yeah. that way. Do too. you know who he is? I don't. He think did so. Action Movie Kid. Remember those? Yes, videos? yes, I do know who he is. Yeah, he did this one where he makes like this these 3D this like 3D underwater submarine, and oh, he uses yeah. red giant two part Aquaman tutorial. Oh yeah, like it's like mind blowing it's like a studio level vfx shot that he does in like an hour it's like full cg 3d camera moves like underwater <laughs> like it's so nuts that guy is so good yeah most good. of my texts to him are just me saying go to hell because <laughs> he'll turn in a tutorial and it's just it's like look i get it i know like he worked at dreamworks for many years and then he started putting vfx into his home movies with his kids right and those things went viral. He started a YouTube channel off of it, signed with Maker Studios. He's great. And he'll turn in these tutorials that he, he did in like two days that literally teaches you everything. Like, yeah, it's utterly absurd. I'm honored that you would put me in that group of people with like Kramer and Freddie and... And Mary Poplin. Do you know who she is? Yeah, Mary's great. She's like one of my favorites. She does mocha tutorial. She's a wonderful person. I've met her a few times at NAB. I don't have nearly the skill that any of those people do. Um, and another thing about me is that like I, everything I have learned and subsequently everything I've taught, because I have a real problem with if I learn a little bit about something, I start teaching it to other people as if I'm an expert on it and people believe me. Um, everything, everything that I learned serves my addiction to filmmaking that's the most I, I worded that as pretentiously as I could but like you'll see that like I had I feel like I've had a season of doing VFX tutorials then I had a season of doing writing tutorials it's really like more of whatever I'm currently in the thick of of learning um I can't keep it in my head and I immediately have to go share it and I've been fortunate to have like outlets to do that I taught a semester uh, like filmmaking 101 course uh at a college in Nashville and a few years ago and I, I had to teach like a film history portion of it. And it was like, literally I, I skipped so much of that, like mentally like checked out in class when I was in school and I remembered nothing when you were in film school. Yeah. Absorbed none of it. And suddenly here I was having to teach it. And it was fascinating in ways that it never would have been because I was having a teacher. You're like, have you seen it? Heard of this Orson Welles guy? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Chances are, if you see me teaching something online, I'm just now learning it. Sure. Well, they say that college is wasted on the young, right? And also that the best way to actually retain anything you've learned is by teaching another person, right? Oh, so yeah. That makes complete sense. So let's maybe back up a little bit because I think so... I'm curious about the process of how you come to decide to make a specific short. Like, is is yeah. is the tool first, or is the idea first, and then wh how right. does the tutorial kind of come into it? And before we dive into that, I just want to tell you the thing to me that differentiates you and why you know you're saying that you're flattered we're putting you up there with like Andrew Kramer and these other guys. But I feel like you are, you know, Andrew Kramer, right? Just like amazing with solids in VFX in After Effect. Um, and, you know, these other people have different things, but I feel like y yours are usually filled with the most story. And I feel like your work is really like, hey, I'm telling the story and here's how this VFX are helping the story. Whereas theirs are usually more like, look at this awesome visual effect, right? Keep going. Keep telling me. So, more. so, yeah, so I, on that note to what Matt was asking, like, how do you come up with, with yeah, these shorts? Thanks. 
the best shorts we've done, the tool came first. And by the tool, you mean like they're like, hey, we want to showcase Magic Bullet looks. Yeah, for example, so a few years back, we a Magic Bullet Suite is like our color correction suite of tools like Colorista and Looks, all these color color grading tools. Um, a few years back, we there was a new tool in the pipeline called Magic Bullet Film, which is full of all these various film stock presets, grain emulators and such. So we were tasked with, okay, Magic Bullet Film, let's make a, a short to showcase Magic Bullet Film. And so I usually start with like, there's the obvious, what does the tool do visually and what, what kind of visual concepts come to mind based on that. So like an example of that is Plot Device. It's the first short that was for Magic Bullet Looks. Uh, and that was like a Pepsi filmmaker short of a concept. Like kid gets a button he every time he pushes the button he's suddenly in the middle of a genre of film and we're able to show off a different color grade right it's like oh now we get to go to the noir one uh -huh. it's now we're no it's noir in now we're in western you know, old uh, romero zombie now we're in blockbuster teal and orange i will say um as a quick side note the coke films used to be uh things that you would do in college and you get a little bit of money and um you'd make like a cool adventure movie or whatever and they'd have a Coke at the end. Now they're just straight up Coke commercials. Yeah. It's it's such a bummer. If you go to Regal, they screen them in front of them and just like, come on guys. Where's well, like, yeah, where's your Indiana Jones rip off, right? That's, I don't know what I pitched. I pitched plot devices like, so this is going to be, it's going to sound like a movie that you're forced to watch before a movie. <laughs> uh, but we're going to try to make it unique and interesting. Um, and do you have like a budget that they give you before you decide how, what usually, you're going to do? Usually, yeah. Um, started out around 10 grand in the plot device days. Uh, nowadays, it's usually we have this much for this year for films. And so uh, it was like 25K we had to do two shorts. So I put 22 or 23 into this big action short that I had been wanting to make for a little while. And then I put like 2,000 into this other one for Magic Bullet Film that I thought, I'll shoot the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I'll put my brother Ben as a star. We'll shoot it impulsively. Every day I'll wake up and call him and make him, you know, meet me somewhere and we'll shoot this little. Is that the bag one? And this is, uh, so well, so the go bag was the action one that I put all the money into. Okay. The one that I put the tiniest amount of money to was, ended up being the better film it's called Old New. And that was the one that had to showcase Magic Bullet Film. And the way we got to the concept was that uh, we looked at it thematically in terms of like, this is a tool that takes new pristine footage and makes it look older and in some ways slightly crappier. And so like in a artistic way. So like uh, what, um, that a lot like the themes that come to mind there like we ended up in a place uh, uh, like and being able to kind of say something culturally about like this is at the time when instagram filters looked mm -hmm. more like you know you'd lit your photo on fire right, right. than burn the edges and uh and i had just personally just bought a house and we were like buying furniture for it and everything and so it was like in the middle of like materialism sure. uh that, you know, the Russian materialism that hits you when you suddenly own a home and want to fill it with. You're like, oh, now we need a credenza. I didn't know what that was. And yeah. everything is reclaimed wood. Right. And so Old New became the story about and about this guy who uh, becomes, who is obsessed with only new things and then who like owns all the newest technology, et cetera. And it's told uh, in rhyme, it's told like a, like a children's story. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he becomes obsessed. He sees these old paintings. He becomes obsessed with old things and then goes down the rabbit hole of novelty and nostalgia. And like, and uh, it's, uh, and that ended up being the better film. Uh, and because we started with, or the product and mm -hmm. kind of like grew the story organically. Right, right. Rather than like, oh, I want to do an action movie and like uh, we can use some of the yeah, green go, or whatever. Yeah, or Go yeah. Bag, the same right. movie that year that we put more of the money into, which yeah. I, it is a fun short and I'm proud of that, but it was, um, that was a concept that I had had in my head for a couple of years and wanted to go make and we kind of retrofitted it. Right. We used right. products for it, but it wasn't, it wasn't organically rooted in the product. And so, um, yeah, it's like if uh, the better marketing material ends up in, ends up usually for us becoming the better content. Um, it's really been more about the kind of the street credibility it brings, or sure. like the idea that like we're more than anything, it's it's showing like we're making content that you're watching that you like. It like we're filmmakers, we're making tools for filmmakers, uh, and so it brings credibility to our products. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think genuinely, you know, 
as filmmaking has changed so much and like the way that we problem solve, the way that we self teach has evolved thanks to these tutorial videos. Right. Um, and when you get the repetition of hearing of these plugins over and over and over again, all of a sudden you just have an awareness and you realize like, Oh, this is what I need to level up my game. You know? Well, so I'm curious personally, like what, like what's your end goal? Like, do you, like, do you want to do features? Do you want to do TV shows? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, okay. So I've been in LA, I've moved to LA three years ago. I've been answering this question a lot and not had a good answer because the truth is, I think all of us can inherently say like, we got into this because we wanted to make, we wanted to direct feature sure. film, like features. And now that looks very different. And so we're all open to whatever opportunity comes along. But yeah, ultimately directing, writing, directing features, TV shows. So these past couple of years have been a uh, an experiment in figuring out how to get there. Mm-hmm. We'll figure out what that looks like and how to get there. Can I ask why you decided to move to LA? Well, it was an inev- it felt like an inevitable thing. We needed to at least try. We, since, like since your Sinatra family? Morning. Sorry, yeah, my wife. and So I, we have three kids and we knew, okay, so since 2011 when Plot Device hit and suddenly there was all this opportunity, potential opportunity out here. It was the constant question of when are you going to move to LA? When are we going to try moving to LA? And it hit us a few years back. Our kids are, if we wait too much longer, it's we're going to be uprooting them even more. Mm-hmm. So while they're young, we should try it. But let's wait until all heat that I have in my career goes totally cold and then move. Mm-hmm. Wait, really? <laughs> Not on purpose. Oh, uh, that's how it worked out. Because uh, <laughs> I'm really good at this. Um, no, so three years ago, we moved out here. But you know that everyone, when they move to LA, they have that feeling. Because all of a sudden, you're in Nashville. You know, you start out, you're in Nashville, and you're like the star. Like if anyone needs a commercial, if anyone needs anything yeah. film related, Set the Worley, yeah. the Worley brothers are the guys to talk to. And Nashville's not a super small marketplace. You know, there's still plenty of production happening. So, like, you still climb your way up, oh, yeah. and like, you know, well, my, there's some action, right? So you're like, I did it. I'm ready for Hollywood. Let's do this. Well, right? the big, so like, the, you know, feel like it was inevitable. We need to try it. That was kind of the the larger scale motivation. Mm-hmm. On a smaller scale, in a more immediate sense, I I wanted to try things that were a lot harder than what I was doing and I wanted to fail a little harder and this I felt was the best place to do that sure uh, <laughs> yeah we're great at failing <laughs> yeah. and so I, I wanted to work with a little more crews full of people that I didn't know um, I, I wanted to take on more intimidating opportunities mm-hmm. and I got to do that uh, you know I'm very fortunate to have gotten to do that now I've gotten to a place where I would uh, I'm ready to get back to making some more stuff sure yeah um and the so the pause in the shorts you said before that you had it's been a while since you've made one what do you think was the cause of that i moved to la and my sure. production infrastructure was all back in nashville gotcha and so um it became a lot harder mm-hmm. to put together and also the motive like well there's a lot of factors going into it there wasn't an immediate need for shorts at the time i've also since i've been out here i've been trying to get been hungrier to get larger projects off the mm-hmm. ground yeah um, i always say sometimes it feels like if you're gonna do a short you might as well do a feature well right? that's kind of the season we've gotten into now yeah or or pilot, sure or yeah proof of concept is yeah, what yeah. i'm what i'm pushing for yeah and then right. you get in your own head and you're like well uh, nah, i'm just gonna a play video games oh, yeah, <laughs> sure. yeah. well i loved what you oh god it, you guys said it in a uh, recent episode where somebody said that like every proof of concept is just the shittiest version of your movie. Uh, oh, um, then probably Sam's Viebelman. No? Could be that, or maybe Carrie Gologly. Did you listen? Maybe it was. Yeah, um, yeah that's who it was. It yeah, wasn't yeah. on, but that's I heard it on Sam's episode. Oh, I see. It. Yeah, yeah, that's um, right. Because he makes like incredibly um, great looking proofs of concept videos. I I've found anything that I've made to as a proof of concept for a larger thing is so much worse than the things that I make just to be the smaller mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. It's this horrible paradoxical thing so yeah moved out here to la and started directing more commercials uh started doing more kind of boring behind the scenes marketing stuff at red giant i took mm-hmm. over the social media channel for a while yeah you're just kind of adulting basically yeah it's like wor- working class filmmakers some sometimes you're just like oh well you know uh, i've got kids i want to go to the recital so i'm going to make some commercials and you know Life is going to be, you're living the good life is, is the hard, maybe the hardest part, right? Uh, yeah. And, and I also <laughs> became hungry to like try to, I really wanted to get into rooms to pitch things 
and be rejected. Like I, it's so weird to say this, but I came out here hungry for rejection. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to, t- I tell the story a lot in talks. Grandparents had a lake cabin in the middle of Texas, uh, where the only thing to do was ride a go-kart that my, all my cousins would all fight over. And I was the youngest and you could either wait in line to get to all day to get to ride the go-kart for three minutes, or you could, my grandfather put out the riding lawnmower, took the blade off and said, this is here too, if you want it. <laughs> no one wanted the riding lawnmower. Sure. So I got on the lawnmower and rode that thing all day while my cousins fought over each other to get, you know, three minutes on the go-kart. I tell the story a lot to say like, right, Nashville versus LA. Lean into like, you know, figure out what you can like lean into your kind of your weak points, lean like... But I hit this, It's that story started to sour and become this, this story of kind of settling for, uh-huh. potentially settling for less. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, why am I not going faster? Yeah. Well, because I'm on the, the lawnmower. And yeah, like, yeah. am I cheating myself out of a right. potentially more exciting career or just like, you know, yeah. trying I mean, to get more competitive? And That is the issue with people who live in good marketplaces, but not. Los Angeles, right? It's like you make good money, cost of living is cheaper, and it's not the sexiest stuff you could be shooting. Whereas here, the better stuff sometimes doesn't pay as well, and like the cost of living is crazy, right? Yeah. And, and you know, you get <laughs> more at bats and you're striking out more. Well, there's this other tutorial guru that I love, Nick Campbell of Grayscale Gorilla. Nick is the greatest person you could ever meet in your entire life. I He's my favorite person on the planet. Oh, I've never met him, but I like his beard. He's wonderful. Um, But he always talks about like when you're working at a company, it's always best to be the worst person at the company, right? So you're learning from everyone else. And if you're the best person, you're the one that's teaching everyone else, then you should probably leave that company. Yeah. And that's kind of, I feel like where you got to in Nashville, probably. I felt that way personally, whether or not I was actually the better, the best. Right. But you're not learning as much on a daily basis as when you are, you know, working with, with all these other people that are just as passionate as you are. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's like what your addiction to failure is. Like, I want to be, I want to pitch an idea and have the person next to me pitch a better idea, right? Yeah, and uh, I've gotten to do that. Well, for the longest time I got here, I was frustrated that I couldn't even get in rooms and get mm-hmm. to do that. Yeah, that's a, a big step to be pitching in the first place, right? Yeah. Parallel to that has been trying to write more longer form stuff. Mm -hmm. And I've been learning, man, the biggest thing, the obvious thing, I've been writing shorts for so many years. You know, you can sit down and write a draft of a short in four hours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't, a feature takes... Coming from web series is the same thing. It was like, my wife would drop me off at a a coffee shop and you'd leave with an episode (laughs) you felt great about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I... I want to jump that in. little dopamine hit. It's hard <laughs> and to dive chase, into yeah. features now. You're like, it, it's you suddenly like, wow, I'm not good at this. Like you start <laughs> sure. to like yeah, question yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to right. make your goals smaller. You know, like it, you can't be like, well, and now I'm done. I did the whole thing. You know. But even then, you're like, now I'm done. I did four pages. Yeah, I'm sure. so great. Like it yeah. feels fake. Yeah. And when you really, when you write your short, sorry to interrupt, but uh, and this is like a perfect segue into the plot devices to talk about plot devices. But I just want to ask one last question about shorts, yeah. which is. When you are writing all your shorts, are you trying to make them viral in some way? No, no. And because most of them don't. Like Plot Device was me trying to get free software. and mm-hmm. do the, It was a season where I was trying to do the bare minimum. We were pregnant with our second kid. And my wife had was quitting her job this time, not just taking maternity leave. And she and I, she was like, she was breaking down crying. She was in one afternoon, she was convinced we were going to be homeless. And it's like, no, we're not right. We're fine. I'll sit down. I'll prove it to you. And I was sat down on a spreadsheet and <laughs> in about an, in 30 minutes, I was like, we are going to be homeless. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, like I better get, yeah. get something going. <laughs> so I, uh, I went into a season where I was like, okay, I'm going to say yes to everything. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do the absolute bare minimum on all of it and not be ambitious whatsoever. And I'm going to save as much as I possibly can. And that was one of the most creatively fruitful seasons of my life. I let like, go of the pressure of being any good. Mm-hmm. And and enjoying anything and ended up being able to enjoy it so much more. Um, and plot device was smack dab in the middle of that, and it ended up being one of the most creatively fruitful and fun, like in terms of collaboration and in terms of actually the experience of making it and the product itself. That it was like an insane like, icing on the cake and cherry on top. That it kind of broke out and found a larger audience than we ever expected. But after that, weren't you like, oh, I hope this next short goes viral? And aren't you like, what short will blow people's minds? 
No, VFX for the lo- for longest time for me during that season that season especially. So I had just learned After Effects a year before I did plot device, and I had found that, and that taught me After Effects. I'd been fascinated in VFX, and I'd been doing it weird in camera VFX up until that point and everything. But like suddenly, I had this big tool that you know sure. broke me out of the plateau and up to the next level. And in that season, I would watch a VFX tutorial, and that gave me something to write it gave me something to write around or content like oh look at this cool thing we can do i am now going to write something around that right and james cameron is kind of famous for yeah. being inspired by technology to make like avatar sure yeah well and i think that or to your point of like oh sometimes you're procrastinating and you watch a tutorial it's that same sort of process of like maybe i can see a thing that they do in plot devices and maybe I'll go make my own noir because I know that I can now or I have a way of kind of like augmenting the thing that you're teaching us into something that we want to do ourselves. Right? Today I pitched uh, my brother has a band and he's like, send me a song. He's like, can you think of music video ideas for this? And of course my one, first idea was like, yeah, it's just a wonder. It's like a drone shot. And we just like put each band member at a different house in my neighborhood. We just like fly from band member to band member. Right. That's one idea. The other one is context aware Phil Right, this new feature yeah. in After Effects. Um, the name of the song is "Go Away." Right, <laughs> this guy thing about like things he doesn't want in his life anymore. And I'm like, oh, let's just use this tool. You're it's just, just making a promo for Content Aware Phil. Yeah, and so Content Aware Phil is like, like a name. It sounds yeah. like a person we're referring yeah, yeah. to. Um, yeah, you're like it's putting a, down Phil. It's yeah. a feature <laughs> in this brand, <laughs> brand new After effects, effects, the 2019 version, where you can literally just erase things out of video footage automatically. And I was like, that's that's the whole video. It's like you're walking around Hollywood Boulevard and all of a sudden man's Chinese theater is gone. You know, like, let's just go to famous places and just content where Phil things. Well, they were going to shoot a whole video and then just erase him. And I was like, you know you can just shoot it <laughs> yeah. without him. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to do that. Yeah, right. Well, I was hoping you'd get, like, weird artifacts and stuff, you know. Too. Oh, yeah. I'm sure um, that's possible. But, yeah, but it's like that technology. That's what I, that's to me what's fun about music videos is, like, messing with, with new technology, you know, and trying to something yeah. weird. Yeah. But I, I think this is like a good time to, to transition to talk about plot devices, which is, it almost seems like a tool that you invented to help you. It was for me. To entirely. keep track of writing longer form scripts, right? Yeah, it all goes back to JJ. Sure. Like, <laughs> literally every story starts with JJ. Yeah, well, we should have named that podcast. So that. let's bring yeah. him in. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. yeah he's hey, been JJ. so quiet. Hey, man. Oh, he's, <laughs> you have a cold? Yes. Yeah. A little horse. He's dead. JJ's dead. <laughs> Seth, um, can you speak for JJ? Yeah, obviously. So, no, I had, um, uh, this is back when Jeff Goldsmith still hosted the Creative Screenwriting Podcast. Sure, yeah. He, um, he uh, it was, I believe it was from Mission Impossible 3. He had Kurtzman and Orsi on and they were talking about, they mentioned, in, I've never heard anywhere else. And they wrote Shrek, right? No, no. no. They wrote uh, Star Trek. Star Trek. And Transformers. <laughs> Star Trek. <laughs> the Shrek. Transformers movie. Yeah. Star Trek. I'm trying not to go down the Star Shrek rabbit hole now. <laughs> um, but I remember they've said something about JJ likes to visualize a story like in like a clock and basically just like put a movie in a circle and you can see just it's a way the, to visualize the There's journey. symmetry to it, right? So it's well, like so, the, it's the hero's, hero's journey, but in like a round sort of map. Well, so basically. the symmetry part came a couple years later. I was, I had a feature idea that the structure of it, I wanted to emulate the structure of a uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade because it was a similar story about the main character searching for a like a hero figure of of his. It was basically like when does Henry Jones come into the story? And I remembered this clock thing, which essentially was just that. It was he looks at it on a circle. That was essentially all that they conveyed in that story. So here I am wanting to rip off Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And so I'm watching the movie and I remember the clock thing and I'm like, no, eh, it could be fun. All right, let's figure this out. So I start writing down time codes for specific beats when they happen. And I did the math and I kind of converted it onto a clock and I started tracing story threads. And I noticed that that if you trace the story threads, there were, there was interesting sy- the symmetry started to show up and that like, you know, Indy's dad would be mentioned in this one particular place in the clock, and then on the symmetrical opposite side part of the clock, he comes into the story. So then I started doing this with a lot of movies, and I looked like a conspiracy theorist. Like I had all these <laughs> right. circles drawn on paper, and I had all these lines like drawn around them, look like baseballs. And Raiders, you know, you take go to, to a perfect story structure, a perfect movie. You look at Raiders, you look at where you know the arc is first mentioned, and we see the picture of it in the book of the arc open and you know light bursting out of it killing people and then you go down to the exact opposite vertical opposite part of the clock and you have where they find the location they get the arc on the symmetrical opposite part Mm -hmm. and then they actually open the arc 
It's literally like you could cut the thing in half. Right. It's like clockwork. And so you, you, you're you looking at that and you're like, there's a real tool for filmmakers who maybe don't have the entire story mapped out, right? Like the, the beauty to me of what a story clock does is you can say like, I know I have these things and they kind of need to fall in certain spots. Like, you know, maybe what your end is or what yeah. your beginning is or what your low point is. Right. And then you can look at it and you go, oh, uh, well, if I see symmetrically where this needs to be relative to the other things, right? Or maybe I've done my homework and I kind of have looked at the different, you know, timing of the other other movies that kind of structurally match what I'm trying to do. And I can say, oh, well, the inverse of this low point matches this spot on the clock. And then that kind of inspires, like how to fill in what you need for your character. Yeah, because like when you get an idea for a movie, when I get an idea for a movie, I don't get one log line. Sure. I get a big pile of ideas that are usually like sequences, characters, overall like story. And anybody with a decent idea or understanding of story structure has a pretty good idea of where a lot of those things will fall. Mm-hmm. So like what I'll do is I will write everything down in like a big old idea pile and then I'll start putting things on the clock where I think that they go. And then because of this whole symmetry thing, which by the way, in no, in no way like insinuates that Lawrence Kasdan, you know, wrote Raiders of the Lost Ark in a story clock. It just shows that like great storytelling has like a certain rhythm and rhyme to it. Right, right. And it is still classic hero's journey though. You know what I mean? What's nice is that, yeah, you can put any, any, uh, methodology or structure into this thing as you want but the idea is like whether it's hero's journey or not you're using that like classic structure to be able to know where your ideas probably fall mm-hmm. ideas you currently have and then where like most people go wrong or where I struggle is like if you're putting that out on a linear line you have these big blank areas and you don't know what to f- fill them with and so the temptation is to kind of inject ideas and in they inject scene ideas mm-hmm. to try to get you from A to C um, but I had a a screenwriting professor once say that comedy can never be injected. It can only be extracted. Hmm. And in writing, it applies to, it can be applied to everything. And that like a lot of times the worst thing you can do is inject some kind of foreign idea into B to get you from A to B to C. But by looking at putting this stuff in a clock and looking at the opposite side of the clock and saying, what can I, what's happening over here that I can set up or that I can pay off? You're then extracting an idea out of what you already have and, and already on your way toward a more organic structure. Whether you end up following that structure as you write or not, it's just, it's a crutch. Like it's a really, really great, it became a really great crutch for me in my process of like stumbling around through the dark trying to put a story together. Mm-hmm. And so I ta- I started talking about this briefly in like behind the scenes things for our shorts. Is it Red Giant related or like? No, when- it was, it was just, my personal process that kind of developed Mm -hmm. for myself yeah just Um, like as you're kind of generating ideas you you figure out what you like and what you don't like basically right and you're like oh this is a system that works for me and so as i would talk about it people would ask more about it and we're kind of freaking out about it and so around that time i was watching john august do his uh, kickstarter for the writer emergency pack and i was also which was like a deck of cards basically that you could draw from and would be like oh cool like i you know i i i'm stumped you pull a card out of the pack and it says like what if your villain knows everything you know or something yeah. like that right? and i big john august fan it's a good uh, good idea yeah. my, for the thing i'm working on that's literally one of the cards literally what back. it is yeah, it's yeah. really cool yeah and but even more than that i was really intrigued by the kickstarter experience itself mm-hmm. um it was one of the first things i kickstarted and actually followed the updates and i found like oh this is its own entertainment experience to be able uh-huh. to craft for people and it looked like a lot of fun so had you, so you'd never kickstarted anything before i think that. i had but i hadn't been i hadn't cared enough like I'm a big fan of John, so this was now something Sorry, I wanted to you, pay attention to. You had to. never crowdfunded something yourself, I mean. Like, you never had to. Oh, personally? No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hadn't. Because and you so, have Red Giant paying for all your shorts. That's great. Because I'm, lo- I'm loaded <laughs> with cash. I'm just flushed with cash. Um, no, and so I uh, am watching this Kickstarter along, and at the same time, i am also become kind of hungry to... I've been wanting to make apps. Uh-huh. And my buddy, Michael Lanier, had just uh, gone to this boot coding boot camp. Micah designed all the titles for all my films. And he, if you watch any of the films, there's a, a recurring pizza guy character. And that's, that's Micah. He <laughs> plays that guy. Um, so Micah had been like, uh, had made the mistake of telling me at the time, like, do you have any ideas for apps? I'm trying just to make some stuff. Let me know. Mm-hmm. He regretted that immediately when I would just start texting him lists of... <laughs> Of ideas, and one of them was a story clock, an app to be able to like drop your ideas into a clock very quickly and be able to outline something and spit out on a beat sheet. And at the same time, I wanted to kickstart something, so I got my friend Ann Fogarty, and who 
we produced a couple of my shorts prior. And I said, I really want to do a Kickstarter. I really want to do an app. Let's do this together. Let's do a story clock app. Let's do a Kickstarter for it. And will you run the Kickstarter? And kind of run logistics on the project. Micah, you'll make the app. And I'll be the creative genius who gets all the credit. And we'll go forward. Life is good. Yeah. yeah I could detail the perils of how we got to a notebook and everything. But it basically, <laughs> we learned very quickly that apps don't, uh, it's harder to kickstart an app because Apple only allows you a certain number of free passes. Oh, uh, right. Um, yes. And so uh, we obviously were expecting many, you know, backers. Sure, so more than the 50 that Apple allows you or whatever exactly. it is. And so yeah. it was, um, I joke, we weren't really expecting more, but we knew that it would be in trouble if we couldn't offer everybody the app. Right. At the same time, we were being really ambitious and dreaming up these this elaborate Kickstarter campaign where we could... Um, where we had like, you know, all these stretch goals and all these, mm-hmm. you know, larger reward tiers. And one of those was a, you know, those stretch goals or reward tiers was like a hipster notebook version of it. Mm-hmm. And in our research, we had discovered like, we could do that now. Right. And so we quickly like pivoted toward a notebook and we we were convinced no one was going to <laughs> like want it. And it was really something that I wanted to be able to get enough money to print a bunch so I could have a like a, a, a pile of a stack of them to be able to use for years to come. And let me ask, in terms of where we are chronologically, Baron Fig notebooks had already launched. Like there was, was there a history of like? So I became cool... aware of Baron Fig afterwards, so I don't know. Gotcha. Um, but That's like, just a, a, a hipster notebook that was successful on Kickstarter. Yeah, basically. For, there yeah. Uh, and there's also the Spark notebook is one that I backed. They're really great. Baron Fig though is the most. That's the one where it maybe it lays flat. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think, think so. That, yeah. We intentionally designed it. You know, we were very inspired by Field Notes and the approach to making something that felt expendable mm-hmm. and felt like something you wouldn't be afraid to write in. You hold it in your hand and you were expected to beat the crap out of it, fill it up, and buy right. more. More composition notebook, less moleskin. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We wanted to be very much like an agricultural utility. And we determined that $12,000 was the bare minimum that we could ask for and, you know, be right. able to afford enough books to be able to keep some. Right, because all of a sudden now you have to like ship things and like print them and like there's all sorts of like hard costs that are associated with manufacturing a, a honest to goodness product that a app you don't have, right? Yeah, and we were convinced that, you know, we needed to sell it for 15 or something like that and we were on the fence of whether or not people would think that was worth it. We're just afraid of looking like idiots. So going online and asking for $15 sure. for a notebook full of circles and lines mm-hmm. and Anne's going to kill me that I just said that. I don't know. No, no, but I mean, but... I think that there is, that's true for all notebooks too, right? Like a yeah. notebook is a stack of paper, right? Yeah. So, you know, there's design to it, right? And there's utility and then there's intent. And I think that the circles and lines, that's really just reminding you, this is what this object is for. It's not just blank paper. Can I tell you, I pay $5 a month to 750words.com, which is like just a website that counts how many words you type and really? tells you how many words you typed every day. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Worthless, right? <laughs> no. Awesome. Like like, the, like Word could do it. Notepad could do it. It's, anything it's like do the, it. the uh, artist's way. Right, it's it's your word. It's your yeah, your two your pages, two pages, two hundred, yeah, yeah. seven hundred. That's yeah. excellent. But it's but part of the paying is like to obligate yourself to use it. What's funny is this actually goes right back to what I was saying about tutorials at the very beginning of this podcast. Is that yeah, story clock, dude? Well, the story clock, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> there we go. Symmetry it was not planned at all, and I'm very proud. <laughs> um, we very quickly developed this mantra that now is still a kind of a very much our mantra for anything we make at Plot Devices, which is everything should be useful, should be educational, and should be inspirational. We wanted to make a notebook that you could hold in your hand and not be afraid to write in. That would make you want to do work that would have hidden flavor in it that would reward you for the work you were doing and would inspire you to do more work. Um, and that would the process of, of just looking at it would teach you a new way to approach your own work. And so we put the storytelling resources on the inside covers. Mm-hmm. So, you know, field notes, I love they have they have a ruler on the inside. Sure. They have all these things like we put. So we put like the Joseph Campbell, like oversimplified in there. We put character archetypes. We put a page to minute, like a time code to uh-huh. page uh, converter. Because like, you know, we know like generally a page of a script equals a minute of screen time, but that gets really complex if you're trying to study a movie and convert it over to page to put into a, it's super nerdy, but it's like, oh, right. this is a very it's in, for the super version. specific right. nerdy storytelling resource we can put in our own like story ruler on the back. Right. And so launched the Kickstarter, 
um, asking for 12 grand. We ended up raising 120,000. Um, yeah. and that was just, it was crazy validating. Not even valid, just like, it was, it was wonderful to see that like this thing that helped me, this crutch I had made to help me walk through mm -hmm. writing my own stuff that was actually connecting with people and helping other people. So out of that, we started a company called Plot Devices, named after first, I'd always wanted to make kind of a, in my head, the perfect like Seth Worley career to work toward had like, was, you know, Seth Worley, major motion picture director, and then his like third man records mm -hmm. equivalent mm -hmm. on the side of right. filmmaking related Your Coppola tools. Coppola wines. And, Yes, my 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 well, my, vine my vineyard is the third thing. Sure, I don't know anything about wine. That's not going to happen. <laughs> um, and now suddenly, I found myself being able to open that gift shop before I necessarily had the right. motion picture career. It is fascinating to me because I think that there is a entrepreneurial spirit that a lot of filmmakers kind of have to have, right? Especially when the business is being reinvented all the time. You know, you have to figure out your own path, right? So you were joking about like Coppola having wine, but like Soderbergh has his own alcohol brand. Jordan Brady has hot sauce, a fellow podcaster and commercial director. But I, I think there's something interesting about you kind of learn all of these skills of marketing and distribution and like, you know, you, you've spent your life online. So you, you develop this kind of toolkit and there's a part of me that's like, well, how do I use this in ways that feel different and can teach me something new, but at the same time still kind of gets to, you get to use those skills again. Like, honestly, that's how I feel about the podcast. You know, like we do a lot of like Patreon merch and things like that more because I just like doing that stuff. It's fun. You figure out different processes than it is like profitable for us. <laughs> well, no, it's, you know? the, it's, it's hugely like. It's tactile, right? You know, there's something real about it in a way that so much of what we do is ephemeral. And it's easier to measure also. Like, hey, yeah. this many people want to buy this thing, Well, right? yes, that's great. But, I, you know, I love, I was, we were talking beforehand, but the Emily Best scene in Spark uh -huh. episode, yeah, you guys, yeah. she said, like, I, I listened to that, that episode several times and shared it with a lot of people because her quote if you're a filmmaker working today, you are an, something like an online entrepreneur or mm -hmm. you are a digital entrepreneur that you have to accept that now. And I love that so much. It's like Ted Sim said, the internet won, get over it, right? Yeah, right. I, I can just speak for myself. Any, any of these side projects that I've done have come around to directly influence and help me be better at this, whether it be in the business side or in the creative side. So I got the opportunity to do another short at Red Giant. It is a proof of concept for a feature I've been writing for the past couple of years. So who's going to own it? I own the story. Red Giant owns the short. Generously, the only thing they asked of me was that it um, be able to live on their YouTube channel mm -hmm. in perpetuity. So they could remain, whether they're involved with the feature or not, they can remain part of the narrative of the creation of the, of right. the feature. Right. right. And then the opening credit has to say, directed by Seth Worley of Red Giant. Uh, no. <laughs> it has to say, an Orrin Kaplan film directed by <laughs> Seth Worley. Yeah. Um, I like that. Uh, no, just Red Giant presents... <laughs> so the really film which always sounds nice the what i'm getting at is like so now that i've been doing this and i've been running plot devices and releasing products and making these marketing videos for them i'm suddenly like now i'm like well it kills me the idea of making a short and releasing it the way we used to mm -hmm. in terms of we just put it on the internet and then put a tweet out and it's wait kind of like hoping for the best a little it's, bit yeah right? it's yeah. like no like i know how to market now i'd like to market this film and, and to be fair the twitter following for Red Giant and the YouTube subscription, all of that stuff is part of that. that yeah. That's a fan base that's already built in. Right? Yes, but there's now there's other channels to be able to pursue mm -hmm. another, like now uh, the ability to like, to leverage interests that people have that might like fan base or Red Giant fan base may have in another short to be able to like start a mailing list and then be able sure. to create a lookalike audience from that and be able to actually create Instagram ads for the short to put out toward people and just to try to like get people to come look at it. I guess we gotta start this mailing list thing. Everyone's talking about it. I put one on the website yesterday. Oh, cool. Yeah. We got a mailing list. Yeah. It, it's weird that email is still like a... Is the thing still. Is yeah. the thing still. Uh, you guys use MailChimp or what are you using? MailChimp. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm like legacy. Uh, I'm like sure it's MailChimp. <laughs> You're right. It is MailChimp. Mail, MailChimp was a huge inspiration for us in forming our company because if you look at them, they built this brand that is so fun. Sure. And... Uh, out of the most boring the, out of the most boring thing you could yeah yeah and like so from the very get go I was like look at everything MailChimp does and let's copy as much as we possibly can because they make you really excited about mm -hmm. like I'm starting an email list today yeah I'm like, sure. I am really cool now because I have an email list simply because of like the way that they built their tools and their uh, company that's cool so plot devices and how do people find how can people get your notebook nowadays the Kickstarter's over Kickstarter's way over we now have 
Uh, we now have three main products. We have the Story Clock Notebook, which was uh, the flagship one, the one we kickstarted, and that is half of that book is devoted to researching movies, the way that I talked about how I did with The Last Crusade and Raiders, and then it has like an area for you to write time codes and story beats, and then it has a clock on the other page to be able to convert the movie into a clock and be able to trace uh, story threads and have that there to be able to reference and rip off whenever you are stuck or wanting to like remember and research stuff. It's really nice because you sit down and watch a movie with my son, and you know, we saw Captain Marvel in the theater, but we sure. just came out yesterday. We rented it. We're going to watch it at home. Right. I pull the thing out and I just write. I write it down as we go, and then now I have the structure of that movie there to reference later if I ever want to. Right. Is that one worth referencing? Listen. <laughs> Listen. So that's Story Clock Notebook. Half of it's for research, half of it's for development. We all now also have a pro version of it, a Story Clock Workbook, which is a bigger. It is a bigger version, but it has an extra entire extra spread, a page spread of tools for logging like similar story stories that are similar to your idea and like things to take away from that things not to of uh, pinpointing res- like resources that you could use um like for when I was writing plot device originally for example that whole that concept came about because I had to show off color correction etc what things do I have I only have $10,000 I want to keep as much of it as possible what kind of props what kind of locations do we have well I have my parents front yard which is incredibly photogenic can use that for free I have my brother who looks like Shia LaBeouf and is very charming and funny and will do anything I tell him to and uh, we have this yellow button that I know we bought to use on a previous shoot that came two days late and it looks really cool. We're wanting to use it. And so there's literally places here to write like known resources that you have, how you can use them and exploit them. There's a section for challenges for writing legitimate challenges up front and being able to like pinpoint where the opportunities are in those challenges to lean on them. And on the inside covers are even more uh, resources. We have a really cool genre variations. I like love the genre things. stuff actually. It's super fun. Thanks man. So the story, story clock notebook, story clock workbook, and then the storyboard notebook, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's say uh it's a nice like pocket size notebook for storyboarding like thumbnail storyboards specifically targeted at directors like me who have no artistic ability whatsoever for sketching stick figures perfect man well um you can check out all of those products uh, on our show notes you can like browse around we'll have links to all of that stuff so you or can go to plotdevices.co oh there that's an even you. better way to do it more don't direct. waste your time with that com stuff <laughs> cool well should we jump into unpaid endorsements Unpaid endorsements. Well, I got three. Gonna Ooh, go real fast. Or look at that. One is just a reendorsement. There's this guy on YouTube, Captain Disillusion. Yeah. He's just like so good at what he does. He has we just looked at his Patreon. He gets twelve grand a month on his Patreon. Pretty good. Dare to dream. He's worth it. He should be getting twice as much. Start with his Back to the Future part two VFX breakdown. Oh, it did. Uh, oh, it's great. I was watching, I was showing Matt when he got here, this like blender, which is this 3d software, like presentation he did. That was like, I mean, he must've spent a month planning that thing out. It's just like perfectly scripted. Per- I mean, he's just awesome. Captain disillusion on YouTube. He's a genius. He is a genius. Second thing. So I had a barbecue for Memorial day um, at my house. Sorry, I didn't invite you if a friend of mine is listening that wasn't invited. It was a really last minute thrown together thing. But one thing that a lot of people don't have at parties, which I think is like the most important thing, is put a freaking trash can in the middle of your party. Ample trash cans. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise people are just going to start putting stuff all over the place. Yeah. They feel bad about it too. You know, they're like, well, I don't want to hold this bottle. Is your unpaid endorsement trash cans? Just the concept? When you have a party... Just make sure everyone knows where the trash can is. And the third thing also from my party is like someone came to me and they're like, hey, I need to open this beer bottle. Do you have a bottle opener? And I said, yes. And I handed them a wine bottle opener, you know, the one that has like looks like a man, Mm -hmm. like a corkscrew. And they're like, no, it's a beer bottle. I was like, yes, here's the bottle opener. And they're like, not a wine bottle. And I was like, yes, the top of the wine bottle opener is a beer bottle opener. At what point did you just open their beer for them? Well, their beer was like somewhere else. And it was like. I'm still waiting for you to open this beer. (laughs) Um. But I'm just kidding, I, wasn't I realized that some people don't know that the wine bottle opener, the top of it is a like a beer bottle opener. So just just putting that out You're there in case minds, you don't right. know. <laughs> Seth, you got anything? Uh, do you guys know about Cilantro Mexican Grill in North Hollywood? Yes, and I'm so for it. The Chevron? Fuck yes. Okay. I yes. did not know Have, about it. Y- okay, so uh, first off, it's the best burrito in the Valley, for sure, but it's one of the best burritos I've ever had in my life. I would argue it is the best in Los Angeles. I would, too. Which is, uh, caveat, Los Angeles is a taco town. It is not a burrito <laughs> No, 100%. Town. So it's, yeah. not, it's not a massively... Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's, it's not like you're saying it's the best in San Francisco, right? That would be a different... Right. No, but this out. burrito How? is the taco of the town. Here's why Cilantro Mexican Grill... What, what, what I love about it is the story behind it. I believe his name is Adolfo Perez, the chef's name. He's a Cordon Bleu chef. 
guy worked for Cheesecake Factory for years, like corporate Cheesecake Factory for years. It's like this classic story of working for like corporate and then striking out on his own and getting this space in a Chevron in North Hollywood. Like literally it's in the gas station. It is, like, And yeah. I thought for the longest time, I was like, oh, it's attached to a gas station. No, you go into the gas station <laughs> yeah, and you eat in the gas station. And when he started there, I don't know what led him from Cheesecake Factory to Chevron, but he's in the Chevron. It, when he started out, he had to keep it to like muffins and microwavable things, but was apparently consistently pushing to be able to make his own stuff. When he finally got to, he's now made this burrito that's like, I found it through a friend of mine who's a food blogger for Food and Wine, who was like, oh, you need to go to this place in Chevron. And it was like, it's the best thing to say to people, like to eat a burrito from a Chevron yeah. in NoHo. But I love the story behind of this guy breaking out on his own and being and starting and creating this like wonderful, beautiful thing in the least likely place. Right. It's like a pop-up shop right in a, in a gas station yeah. sure. i mean it's yeah it's, normally you have like pop-up shots in like indie coffee shops right. or like a cool bookstore that then the sells farmer's market yeah exactly. there's a chevron on witset it's yeah, like yeah. at least like in kind of an industrial place too yeah. like it's like yeah i'm so glad you brought that up it's a surf and surf burrito is the one to get um so mine is a video uh from a of a pod a rival podcast i suppose called pod podcast but outside and it's just like two dudes like in santa monica talking to people as part of their podcast bit but the video we'll post is of santa monica like police coming up to the guy videoing them and the him being like hey do you guys have a permit and the guy <laughs> operating the camera is like oh no i'm not with them i'm just i'm just filming them i'm just shooting them um, we're not together. I'm just I'm just taping stuff. <laughs> and then the the guy the him being like, Okay, I guess, fine. And then him going to the guys doing the podcast and they're like, Oh yeah, we're not with that guy. We're just we're just doing audio, is that okay? And he's like, Well, I guess. So it's like him getting out of the the podcaster getting out of having to have a permit by lying and saying that they're two separate parties. Right. The people filming and the people being filmed are, claim to are, not know each other. Exactly. And so it's very funny and worked. Wow. Yeah, that's way better than my, we're making a video for my sick grandpa. Right, right, move, exactly. <laughs> which is like, I think, the classic. What's funny about the video also is that it's so clearly a lie from both parties. <laughs> <laughs> and this this officer well, is just like... Is there's like, a wire from their <laughs> microphone to I his mean, camera. I mean, he's like, you know, clearly pointing They're a camera at them. They're wearing shirts for the podcast, <laughs> like all yeah. matching. Yeah, yeah, yeah they've so got like a table set up. podcast crew on the camera guy. <laughs> table? Yeah, there is a table set up in Santa Monica. So it's like... What, they allow tables in that town? It's crazy. Uh, so anyway, it's a really funny, charming thing. And they're like at the end, they're like, oh, we can't believe that worked. Um, but I think really what it boils down to is like the officer just didn't want to have to write them up. Yeah. Like, it would also, be, you don't need permits, yeah. people. Stop worrying about that. <laughs> I did tell that to a young filmmaker once upon a time and immediately she got her camera like busted. She got broke up and <laughs> really? like, so fast. Yeah. Well, Seth. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Where can listeners learn more about you and StoryClock? SethWorley.com for me. And then and PlotDevices.co for uh, StoryClock stuff. And Seth Worley has your shorts and all your Red Giant stuff. And, and commercials everything. and et cetera. And the nude photos. And the nudes are right there on the front page. I'm like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. Well, you can find out more about the podcast at JustShootItPodcast.com. Yeah. JustShootItPod.com. Both work. Uh, and we would love if you email us your thoughts, questions, uh, if you want Seth to hook you up with uh, anything. <laughs> email us, <laughs> just shoot it pod at gmail.com. <laughs> I'm on Instagram at O Kaplan. And I'm at Mr. Matt Enlow. Uh, we're across the board on social media at just shoot it pod. This episode is produced by Madeline Rosewatt, edited by Jay McCullough, and our webmaster is Ewan Williams. And the music you're listening to is by the artist Jazar and the Free Music Archive. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.